on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. Ethereum gets real with its newly announced Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, which aims to bring standards and governance to an enterprise-level Ethereum protocol. Voltoro is the one-of-a-kind online exchange where you can trade between gold and Bitcoin. Reserves can be audited online at any time and are protected from confiscation and company failure. Sign up for a free account today by checking out the link in the video description below. Hi there guys and welcome to the latest episode of The Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I am your host, Chris Coney. Today is the 1st of March 2017, so let us begin with the market roundup. Actually, I'm lying. Got to do the announcements first. So the February feedback survey is now over. I'll be sending out the prizes this weekend. So keep an eye on your Bitcoin wallet this Saturday for a payment coming from me. We had 183 responses. So assuming they're all valid, you're looking at about 15 cents worth of Bitcoin coming your way, which is a thousand times more than you would get from a Bitcoin faucet. So I'm quite happy with that. Again, the prize fund is linked directly to how much money that YouTube pay me in ad revenue, so don't get mad at me, don't shoot the messenger. Now the most upvoted tagline from that little competition that I ran in the comments of episode 216 comes from Matthew Stimful. Sorry if I've murdered your name there, mate. Uh, with 30 upvotes, and it says here that Chris Coney is the Morgan Freeman of the cryptoverse. The calming articulation of his voice makes anyone feel safe in a volatile world. Now, that actually made me choke up a little bit when I first read it, so please show Matthew some love for his contribution there by sending him a Bitcoin tip to that address right on the screen there. I'll also put a copy of that in the sources of this episode so that you can just copy and paste it into your Bitcoin wallet if you so desire. Matthew, I've sent you a couple of quid myself, mate, so thank you very much for that. Now on to the insanity of the market roundup, graciously provided by coinmarketcap.com. Now clearly the elephant in the room today is the fact that Dash has absolutely rocketed to the third most valuable cryptocurrency in the world by market cap, displacing Monero, Litecoin, and now Ripple. So at $35.99 per coin, after $17 million worth of trading volume, Dash is up 26.74% on the day. In fact, by market cap, Dash now leads Ripple by over $50 million. And I say it like that because it was only a few days ago that I was talking about Dash closing in on Monero and only having a 10 to $20 million gap in order to catch up. You know, how things can change in the blink of an eye, eh? Now, this kind of meteoric rise is enough to make me a little nervous. You know, I like growth. And I like profit, but I'm wise enough to know and to be wary of extremes, both good and bad, right? I do think, though, that Dash is benefiting from somewhat of a perfect storm right now. You know, the high fees and the long transaction times on the Bitcoin network seem to be becoming the new normal. You know, this is just a huge incentive for people to switch over to an alternative. Now, the fact that Dash is now in third place creates this perception that it is the best alternative. And I say that simply because by being in third place, it will be seen to have a lot of social proof. And that will give people confidence to start using it. So it's like approved by the crowd, so to speak. Now, I personally am seriously considering switching over to Dash to pay my affiliates. Because like Roger Veer was saying the other day, if you are actually using Bitcoin as a currency in your core business, Bitcoin is becoming increasingly unfeasible. Now, I stumbled on this article yesterday, which is an official clarification on what Dash haters call the Dash Instamine scam. I'm going to go through this in more detail and reflect on it later today, and I invite you to do also, and then let me know what you take away from it. The Biggest Loser Award today goes to Waves. I think that's the second day that uh, Waves has been the biggest loser. Today, Waves have also published their weekly review, number 32, so if you want to know the latest on what's happening with the Waves project, I'll provide you with a link to the sources as always. 
Waves is therefore down 2.96%, Linga being a Waves token at 19.5 cents a coin, and down at 17th by market cap, and the whole blockchain is now worth about $19.5 million. So for Bitcoin then, there is a rough ascending triangle here, around about this $1,200 mark. So that gradual increase of those higher lows, and then we were having a bump up against 1200 by the looks of things. But even right now, the price has gone above that and is trading at 1205 which is interesting. So that could already be the breakout that I was looking for. So I, I noticed two days ago that the, the, the day closed at like 19, sorry, not 19, 1194. And it's been sort of hovering around that ever since, uh, up until just a minute ago, actually. So what were the closing prices for the last two days coincides with that $1,200 mark. So the market seems a little bit wary of that $1,200 mark, perhaps because there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin potentially approaching parity with the price of gold. In fact, I looked up the price of gold this morning and a gold an ounce of gold is worth about $1,256. So we're not that far off. The question for the market though is to ask itself whether it believes a Bitcoin is worth as much as an ounce of gold. Now, let me know in the comments below. What would you rather possess? An ounce of gold or a single Bitcoin? And of course, if you had to choose, what would you choose? I personally would have half and half, but that's not really the point of the question. Anyway, I still think the price is a little bit overextended from the trend line, but I'm not confident enough about that to actually short it. Time now for the SegWit forecast. First of all, let's take a look at Litecoin. Litecoin has increased support from miners today, up 0.2% from yesterday. That puts the activation out at 88 days time, and that date is the 28th of May 2017, which means Litecoin is still on schedule to ac activate segregated witness before the deadline. Bitcoin, on the other hand, according to Coindance, is still stagnating. The activation projection for Bitcoin activating SegWit is the 4th of March 2018, which is like four or five months too late. So in terms of the news today, I have turned to Bitcoinist.com. This article was written by Wilma Wu and published today, the 1st of March. Okay, so this is going to be a difficult subject because it's one of those things that requires the ability to process nuance, which from what I've seen, seems to be a dying skill. Now, the ability to understand nuance directly relates to both the depth and the breadth of your knowledge on a subject. Now, I believe as people, everyone has equal value. No doubt about it there. That links right into the mission and the ethos behind cryptocurrency to create a level playing field, equal economic opportunity for all. And that's based on the belief that all people have equal value as people and are all entitled to the same opportunity as everyone else. However, I do not believe people are equal in every single aspect. For example, Say Bob has a PhD in cryptography and Jim has a PhD in international law. When they're having a debate about cryptography, Jim cannot consider himself an equal in that respect. And similarly, when they're having a debate about international law, the opposite is also true. It says nothing about their value as people and their human rights, just specifically within that realm of expertise, they cannot be considered equals. So when people get their panties in a bunch, as I imagine many people will do about this new Ethereum news, it does require quite a high level of understanding of the various subjects in order to appreciate the context and therefore see the real pros and cons of what's going on here. But as ever, in the short amount of time that I have in a single episode of the Cryptoverse, and given my limited understanding, and everyone's understanding is limited, I'll do my best to give you my insights on this. So let us begin with the red section as always. It says, Tuesday saw Vitalik Buterin introduce Ethereum's latest venture, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the EEA, as the platform gained rare mainstream media praise. Well, probably because it involved some massive corporations, which the media saw as credible, versus perhaps their perception of a bunch of hobby programmers messing around with digital currency, which the crypto world is anything but. But that's just by the way. It goes on to say that, as such, the EEA promotes closed private blockchains, not public ones. Butterin added a clause that it would nonetheless 
quote, retain compatibility with and enhance public Ethereum, close quote. This to me makes it seem like Ethereum is moving in the direction that would cause it to operate much more like the internet. Right? The internet is a public network, right? But it has many, many, many private networks connected to it. So we are used to this model in the physical world too. We have our private property that we build and use for specific purposes. And then we have public property like roads and parks and so on that allow us to connect all our private property together. I actually read another article on this topic that described it as the public Ethereum network being like the internet and the private Ethereum networks being like company intranets. So then let's move on to the yellow bit, which is further down here. It's another quote. It says the EEA will also investigate hybrid architectures that span both permissioned and public Ethereum networks. Now, Andreas Antonopoulos has made the case against intranet style blockchains a number of times. And his argument is that if a blockchain isn't out in the wild, you know, like Bitcoin is and like the current Ethereum is, it doesn't get exposed to all the viruses and all the bacteria, which would result in an ever stronger immune system, right, to use that metaphor. So this hybrid model, however, sounds like they'll end up with the best of both worlds. And I say that in the sense that the public Ethereum blockchain will remain public, you know, with its billion dollar market cap, thousands of hackers trying to break in and steal everyone's ether, and then the security improvements that are made to the public Ethereum out in the wild can then be ported over to these private chains to give them the same level of security without having to ever expose them to the threats directly. Now that's my interpretation anyway from a high level. If you possess superior expertise on this subject, as always, I invite you to school me in the comments or better yet, come on the show for an interview. I would be delighted to have you. So skipping ahead to the green bit then, it says here, in a rare show of mainstream media support, Bloomberg on Tuesday called it, quote, the hottest platform in the world for cryptocurrencies and blockchains, close quote, also describing it as Bitcoin's top rival. So obviously they're talking about Ethereum there. Could it be Bitcoin's top rival? Well, yes, it could. Imagine if there was an internet coin and you had to pay every time you sent an email or pay a little piece of it anyway. That would give the token value and then people would start using it as currency. Was Ether designed to be a currency? Well, no, but that doesn't prevent people from using it like one. I mean, baseball cards were never designed to be a currency, but kids in the schoolyard use them as if they were. So then it goes on to say here in the blue color, quote, if Ethereum is going to take advantage of the potential that companies like JP Morgan, Microsoft and IBM see in its underlying transaction technology, the blockchain, as the potential backbone that could reshape modern business and finance, it needs to gain wide adoption to become something of a de facto standard, close quote. I think this is going to be one of the major bones of contention for people. It's this, quote, invasion of the blockchain industry by giant corporations. The question is whether these companies getting involved is a good thing or a bad thing. The objection would be that these companies don't tend to take action because they are altruistic. They are public companies and are motivated by opportunities to profit. Now I say, well, that's fine because both can coexist. You're using the private public model in the same way that companies like IBM and Microsoft make money from private clients who hire them to build mini internets for them. And like I said at the outset, this doesn't kill the internet because much like the public roads, we need that public infrastructure to connect the private properties together so that we can do business and have an economy. And that's what I personally see happening with this new Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. There is one major snag for me though, and it's the bit in purple. It says, plans to rid Ethereum of mining altogether and replace it with the long-awaited Casper proof of stake protocol come in for additional praise. Now that to me could be the deal breaker that would cause me to actually retract everything I've said today. I really need a better understanding of this Casper implementation of proof of stake. And this may very well be a naive objection born out of my ignorance, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. And to make it easy for anyone to actually correct my logic, allow me to express it in a numbered sequence so you can identify where the floor is. So one, proof of stake means proving how many of the core tokens that you control. Two, 
Those tokens can be purchased on the open market. Three, to buy the tokens requires money. Four, the more money you have, the more you can buy. Five, these blue chip corporations have massive amounts of money. Six, they could buy up a huge stake in the network and then rule over it. Now, I suspect the reason that wouldn't happen is that a network that is taken over by a dictator would be abandoned and therefore make the token worthless. However, there's no way to know whether the stakeholders are a single entity or a large group of people. Now, it seems never a dull day when I do an episode on Ethereum, so let's begin the discussion in the comments below. So thanks for joining me today, guys. If you liked this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Please leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. And please support the Cryptoverse and boost cryptocurrency adoption by going to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast and becoming a patron. From just a few dollars a month, you can secure Cryptoversity's future, get unlimited access to all Cryptoversity courses and access a private patrons only chat group where you get direct access to me. That is all for today, guys. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.